So I'm going to lead you on a gallop headlong through the tracking work that BTO has done over the last few years and also show you some of the second and third stage uh, findings that we've actually come to. So I'm talking to an audience that really understands why we want to be researching Curlew, but there are particular reasons why we started out tracking Curlew. And the first of interest, of course, is conservation interest. Curlew are declining very rapidly. This is the CBC BBS trend for England, which, as you can see, has levelled out at very, very low. Um, there has been enormous range change, so range retraction, which we've seen in the atlases. In Wales, the BBS index is even worse than the English curve, uh, and it's somewhere only just behind Ireland. And we've seen massive declines and massive range contractions everywhere in the south and east of the range of this bird. So there's a clear conservation interest, but actually you would think that a lot had been done for curlew. So there's been research on grazing and the changes to grassland, uh, which you, on the surface of it ought to promote curlew. But they've seen fairly significant management changes. So bog drainage and peat extraction have had tremendous impacts in Ireland, particularly changes to vegetation structure, changes to the way that we manage grassland, particularly switching from hay to silage. But equally, a lot of money has been spent through agri-environment schemes intended to address these declines. And what we know from BBS, what we know from habitats, is that curlew are actually quite well distributed across a range of habitats. So heathland and moorland, so these are the upland breeding birds. To a certain extent, they're found in pastures, but they're very commonly found in marsh and bogs. I'm not entirely sure why reed bed shows up in BBS for curlew, but I suspect it may be late birds. But with all of this understanding and knowledge, and with the rate of reporting for curlew, particularly in the breeding season, there still do seem to be some questions. So in um, Sam Franks's paper from 2018, this was a paper looking across the whole of Europe at agri-environment schemes and site protection um, and some individual activities targeted towards grassland breeding waders. And broadly speaking, the message in this paper is very good. So across the suite of waders, agri-environment schemes seem to be effective. Higher rate agri-environment schemes are also effective, more so. Nest protection works and there are a range of management options that work. Things like predator control um, and water management in wet meadows. But if you look into this paper a bit more carefully and you separate out the responses of the different species, none of these interventions at this scale were actually effective for curlew. And that's really quite worrying because five years ago, we thought we needed what we knew what needed to be done for curlew. And clearly the birds are telling us that something isn't quite working for them. So I started thinking about what these disconnects might be and looking for ways that we could find out information about curlew without being too dependent on potential sources of error. Um, and really what changed in 2016 was the development of um, GPS VHF tags. So these are tiny GPS tags that are light enough to put on a curlew on a glue mount rather than needing a harness, but capable of downloading their data remotely. And that's quite key because curlew are very sensitive to disturbance. And what I wanted to know at that stage was why curlew were not responding to agri-environment schemes. What is it about a curlew different from all of the other grassland breeding waders? Was it a spatial disconnect? So we're seeing range retraction. Is it possible that agri-environment schemes are happening in places where curlew are not? Is it a problem with targeting those schemes? Is it something to do with spatial scales or the uptake of agri-environment schemes? And the key problems to a researcher in looking at the information that we had about curlew, first of all, curlew are incredibly shy and they're very vigilant. This means that they respond quite poorly to disturbance and a primary disturbance might be the person looking at them. Secondly, 
all of our survey methodologies and all of our research tools up until this point were based on direct observation. So we might only be observing disturbed behavior. And observation itself, Curlew, for all they're the largest breeding wader in the UK, are in, impossibly good at hiding in grassland. They can hide out in plain sight, and many of you have probably seen them hiding in plain sight. So we were using partial information to make assumptions about what the birds needed from us. But a remote, remote download tag allows us to observe the curlew without actually needing to be there to look at them. So the picture here on the top left is one of the tags that I use. Um, it's a solar powered tag, weighs about six grams, and it can be super glued temporarily to the bird, um, which sounds terrible, but the birds actually ignore them completely. And they fall off during the post breeding molt. Um, center photo at the top is of a bird that we've just released flying away. And if you look really, really closely, you can see the tag mounted just in front of the white panel on the bird's back. Um, we catch the birds on the breeding grounds, but before the, the final establishment of a breeding territory or actually of a nest. Um, and I, as I've said, they're, they're temporary um, glue mounts, so they fall off after six to ten weeks, depending on how early the bird goes into molt. And my standard programming is to locate the birds every 15 minutes, 24 hours a day. And this is the sort of thing that we see. This is 48 hours of data from a single curlew located every 15 minutes. And you can already see that that bird's movement scale, and I'm hesitating to call it a territory, is surprisingly large. Actually, we're looking at four fields. So this one is this is about half a kilometre end to end. This is a different bird that was caught in the same area. Um, over the same two day period. And it has a much larger apparent territory or movement pattern. And you can see actually that it's taking in some of this brown landscape, which is um, shallow bog, a triple SI, but also some lovely improved grassland. And this is the third bird that we caught in this pilot season in 2016. Uh, this bird answered all my questions of why I wasn't able to catch curlew overnight, because he was going three kilometers away from his breeding territory up on the top of the hill every night. So around about 8.30, he left and everyone went silent. And at about five o'clock in the morning, he came back down again. So I had been trying to catch him at night when he wasn't there. So far, um, over four years, we've now tagged 25 different breeding curlew. Um, we're operating in three different landscapes uh, and we've tagged birds of both sexes. So we're really starting to build up very much more of a picture of what birds are doing. And I'm going to go through a series of birds separated by landscape type and altitude and by sexes, but also by where they are, where they were in their um, breeding trajectories and whether they were successful or not. And you'll start to see just how differently curlew behave depending on the landscape and depending on what they're up to at the time. So this is a male bird. He was a successful breeder and clearly in a very invertebrate rich habitat. So his breeding territory is very small and very condensed. This is a, a lowland male caught in the same area, broadly speaking but he was not a successful breeder. And you can see that he's traveled all over Anglesey. There are little brown dots over about half of the island. These are tracks from two upland females. One of them bred successfully and the other one didn't. And there's very little to choose between them in terms of overall spatial size of the area that they use in this landscape. In 2018, we caught this bird, which was fascinating. So this was a responsive male. He was territorial. He was on site among the other breeding birds and he would disappear for a week or 10 days or two weeks. And he was buzzing off down to the coast to spend a week on the beach. And then he would come back up amongst the other breeding birds in the mountains and look like a breeding bird and call and display. And then he would take off again down to the coastline. One of the females that we tagged wandered over 500 square kilometers of Wales for a couple of weeks 
after she'd been tagged um, and she was tagged right at the beginning of the breeding season when the birds are just arriving on site and she wandered around for this two weeks and then she settled right back where we caught her and was there all season. Although I don't think that she made any successful breeding attempt. I think she tried two, twice or possibly three times, but she wasn't successful. This male gave me more gray hairs in a week than I think I've ever had in that period of time because he guarded his chicks through having three silage fields mowed and he actually took his chicks across one of those fields when it was being mowed and he was seen doing that. And this male, um, also known to, to his fans as Vincent, for reasons that I won't tell you, um, hatched four eggs in 2018. We actually had a, a thermal logger in his nest, so we know exactly when he hatched his eggs. And he hatched those four chicks and he lost them to a mower at six days old. And because he had a tag on, we could see the change in his behaviour that was associated with that mowing event and with the loss of his hatched chicks. And heartbreaking though that was, this individual bird has probably taught us as much as all of the other birds put together. We could see his behaviour change, we could see him shift from an incubation pattern to a chick guarding pattern and then lose the chicks and start moving into effectively wintering behaviour. So that's all very exciting and it's very pretty and tag data is the most thrilling stuff ever, particularly when it's coming from a, a live bird and a tag that's out in the field. But we need to learn from it because we have a responsibility to learn as much as we can from these birds. So what have we learned so far? Well, one key finding is that the spatial scale that birds move around in these complicated landscapes from a curlew's perspective increases as time goes on. That's not a big surprise. When we catch them, they're generally thinking very hard about settling in, having a nest. They should go into incubation, which you would expect would be associated with very little movement in either sex if they're sharing incubation. And then as time goes on, they become separated from the nest site because either they fail or the eggs hatch and things begin to move. So over time, they move around the landscape more and more. What surprised us was that their behaviour, their spatial behaviour at night is very different from what they're doing during the day. It's centred in the same place, of course, but they're using different parts of the landscape in darkness from the places that we see them during the day. And that's really important because that's potentially where our understanding of what curlew do is disconnected from what curlew actually do over the 24 hours. The spatial scales of movement in breeding curlew can be huge. They do seem to vary with sex, they do seem to vary with breeding status, but these birds are using vast areas. So we're looking at square kilometres here. Something else that we've done um, is a little bit more typical analysis. So we've taken all of those tag relocations and we've overlaid them on a map and we've looked at what sort of habitat, what's, what the land use is underneath all of the points that the bird has clearly been in because it's tag located it there. So these are this is information from three different birds um, and the codes across the axis separate the, the habitat that they're using by standard vegetation classes. Now, I'm sure that there's somebody in this audience who knows these vegetation classes in enormous detail, but I don't. So what I'm going to do or to have done is group them according to broad habitat categories that we all understand. So this is birds using unimproved or semi-improved grassland. This is actually the stuff that's produced by many of the agri-environment schemes options that have been applied for curlew over the last 20 years. We've got two birds here that avoided it and one bird that actually didn't interact with it at all. This is improved grassland. We have one bird that was pretty much neutral about it and used it as a proportion of the landscape 
and two birds that positively sought out improved grassland. And what, what we're talking about here is silage fields and fields that have been reseeded with ryegrass. Dry heath, which appears in the BBS list for habitats for curlew, we have one bird that didn't pay any attention to it, one bird that actively avoided it, and one bird that sought it out some of the time, which is a little equivocal. Woodland, no surprises. Curlew don't like woodland. That's quite reassuring in analytical terms because it means that we're describing something that probably is realistic. This is where it's at for curlew. These are the wet habitats, particularly in the marginal uplands. So this is wet grassland and flushes, wet heath, shallow bog, sphagnum bog. This really is the habitat in that landscape that the curlew are seeking out. But that is the marginal uplands. We're talking about 300 metres up in Wales on the boundary of the moorland. But we noticed that habitat selection is also really, really patchy, even within these vegetation types. And that possibly isn't a surprise. What it tells us is that a vegetation category isn't really describing what a curlew is looking for. So simple vegetation management probably isn't the best index of habitat quality for a curlew. We did start a piece of work looking at what the curlew are selecting for. Um, I had a master's student collecting quite a lot of really interesting data for us, um, but we don't have any of that to present yet, I'm afraid. But one day I'll be able to come back and talk to you about how the birds are selecting those little patches and what it is that they're particularly good at finding. And that's what we need to deliver for them. So that's the data. That's several years and quite a lot of grey hairs and a whole bunch of learning from my perspective. But there are things that we can bring out of that and places that we need to go next in order to understand what's going on. So I have a series of inferences and implications and some unpublished work to talk you through. So first of all, we've got the issue of this potential spatial disconnect between agri-environment schemes and what the curlew think is a landscape. So going back to these huge spatial scales, the smallest apparent breeding territory there is 42 hectares. In Wales, agri-environment schemes are targeted around whole farm compliance, they're optional, and then there are field scale management options. Average farm size in Wales is 48 hectares, and average field size, size is 5 hectares. So a five hectare management agreement in Wales might be very useful, but it probably isn't big enough. And a curlew is going to need several farms or at the very least several fields. And of course, then there's the issue of national participation. A scheme option or a scheme field might be the jewel in the crown of a landscape, but it's really only covering a small area, a small proportion of what a curlew is looking for. We also need to have a think about improved grassland because this is a habitat that curlew really like. Um, we don't fully understand what curlew are doing in improved grassland, although observation suggests that they feed in it very intensively. The adults feed in it. And that's a little bit alarming in itself because if we think about the CBC BBS trend over time, this is the curve from 1966 to 2017. One of the biggest changes in managed grasslands of the last 50 years has actually been the invention of silage. And this plot is the number of tonnes of silage produced in England from uh, the invention of silage, more or less, 1880, through to just, um, just before 2000. And there's an alarmingly tight correlation, given that tons of silage is a very poor index of land of area under silage. That correlation is stronger than I like. And average first cut date in the English lowlands is actually the same week as average curlew nest hatching date. So I do wonder whether silage is actually the most critical land use change that's happened to curlew since they came down from the mountains in about 1940. So in our upland study site, 
um, we there are several ways of looking at population. The standard method, I'll ignore the phone because somebody else will answer it. Um, the standard method is Brown and Shepherd, so it's a multiple visit observational census. And if you assess my Upland study site, it has three pairs in it. We colour mark every bird that we tag. And in 2016, we know that we had at least four pairs because we colour marked three birds and there was at least one more male with no colour marks. In 2018, with more colour marking, now we know that we have a minimum of seven pairs. In 2019, now we have a minimum of nine males, so nine pairs. We've done some modelling work based on atlas records for the area and densities and the bracket for low and high predicted local population is three or four pairs at a minimum, seven pairs at a maximum. And that tells me that if Brown and Shepherd is correct, then that's a low estimate of the population. But actually what it tells me is that curlew are impossible to, to count properly because they just don't help us. Why are they so hard to count? Well, one possibility is that we're counting them on using visual methods that are subject to a huge amount of error. So they're cryptic birds, they're secretive, they're vigilant. So if one bird alarms, everybody else can stay quiet. We might look at counting nests, but there are significant potential impacts from nest counting that we don't really understand in terms of promoting predation risk. The territory, the, the information we have from tags tells us that territories overlap enormously in curlew. Territory mapping processes really only find, find the points where curlew are active and curlew don't seem to defend territories. They may defend the area immediately around the nest cup, but they don't defend the breeding territory in the way that we would normally understand it. And the harder we look for curlew, the more there seem to be in these in, in the breeding areas. But they also visit huge areas of the landscape and they may be territorially responsive in huge areas of the landscape. So we could easily be underestimating or overestimating the population based on these visual tools. And if we formally look at counting pairs um, and we use what we understand from the tag data to assess how well we can count curlew, so the standard, standard methods um, are visual pair methods. So the atlases, the BBS do this, Brown and Shepherd, the standard thing. This is a visual survey. If birds are more than 500 meters apart, they're considered to be distinct individuals. They might count, you might count nests and chicks. And it's based on two visits. So there's an early visit in April to mid-May and a late visit, late May to the end of June. Now, if we look at the birds that we have breeding data for, this is coming from the tag data. This is a list of all of the birds with the different stages of breeding activity. And at the top and in the middle, we've got average data for a male and a female from the literature. And we had two birds here that were a pair. Now this is the window for your early visit. And you can see that in your early visit, birds could be anywhere from not breeding at all and not bothering to breed through the season, through to in their first incubation period, or even after their first incubation period and either failed or gone back into non-breeding or pre-breeding behavior. And all of these birds, when they were tagged, were territorially, territorially responsive. They were all calling, they all responded to decoys and playback. So in the early visit, we counted 16 males. Three of those made no breeding attempt at all. 13 of them might have been pre-breeding or incubating, depending on where in that window you did your visit. Um, so that might be 16 pairs. And in your late visit, you run into similar problems. So this is the window for the late visit under Brown and Shepherd. And we've got eight males now that are post-breeding, but still present and still territorial. Depending on your visit timing, one or two males were guarding chicks at the time, 
three of them actually made it to hatching, which gives me eight pairs. It might give me one, two or three reactive males with chicks. And I might therefore count two or three successful males, but I know that at least four chicks um, were reared by these birds. And then most territories are overlapping. So strictly speaking, you'd never get that 500 meter separation. So curlew just really are very hard to catch. That's the, the, the count. That's the take home message. They don't help. And they, they, the tag data suggests that that's just because of the way that they structure their breeding attempts. So from a statistical point of view, we're working in the darkness. Um, I'll reassure you that this is a bird that we just tagged. Uh, he's wearing a sock on his head because keeping their heads in the darkness keeps them calm and we do take the sock off before we let them go. So does it matter that we're working a little bit in the darkness with curlew? Well it depends on what we really want to know and the important things are population size, that's very difficult, population trend and range, it doesn't matter so much if your counting method is wrong, incorrect, as long as it's consistent. Because if it's consistent, it will detect change. We might want to know the number of breeding pairs using a site. That's really tough because it depends on how you define breeding, whether a territorially responsive bird counts, even if it doesn't have an active nest and doesn't try. Productivity is spectacularly difficult and I wouldn't even like to go there. Sorry. But change in these metrics is something that we can reliably monitor. And that's actually the most important thing if we're looking at response to conservation activity. So the darkness does matter when we're counting nests. So, for example, from our tag data, which is birds that were tagged irrespective of how their breeding season was going to go. So they're they're proportionally representative of the population rather than only representing birds that have nests. But of 16 males, we might have counted 16 or 13 or eight pairs, depending on how we counted them. But those birds established 23 nests. So if we had only counted nests, we would have got a different number. Six of those nests were still being incubated when the birds shed their tags but we know a minimum of three of them hatched chicks and a minimum of two males hatched two chicks each. So how many pairs and how would you measure productivity? And productivity, the productivity question is quite important. So four or more chicks in these 16 pairs would give us productivity of 0.25 but four or more chicks per 23 nests would give us 0.17, which is obviously noticeably lower. Now in Wales, average population productivity, so that's across all of all birds across all Wales, all birds counted using these visual methods, for a stable population, we actually need 0.6 chicks per pair. But that per pair, needs to include the possibility that birds are not bothering to breed. So the productivity per birds that attempt to breed needs to be higher than 0.6. And we need to watch that we don't fall into that pitfall when we're monitoring based on nests rather than attempting breeding pairs. So in summary, there's always more to do. You cannot ever stop a scientist and say you've done enough and Every time I do any work on curlew, I find that I'm asking more questions and I'm looking for more answers and I'm coming up with more things that I don't understand. But we have a couple of good lessons from the field. So first of all, the females are surprisingly responsive and can be incredibly aggressive to other curlew in early April. So if you want to tag females not on the nest, you need to be right really early in April before they lose that aggression. Males are much more responsive than females in May. Uh, in fact, we barely see females in May unless they're non-breeding birds. Breeding density can be a lot higher at a site than we originally thought. 
um, and we have to be a little bit wary about describing territories for curlew in the way that we would describe territories for any other species. Uh, it's all but impossible to catch the same bird twice, uh, which would make me hesitate about using tagging devices that needed to be recovered uh, in order to get the data from them. Having said which, you might notice in the pictures on the right hand side of my screen, the bird at the top is wearing a ring mounted geolocator, which at some point I'm going to have to try and recover. The lessons from analysis, analysis are just as interesting, actually. So we have this huge territory spatial overlap. Curly really don't defend a territory. Um, at any one time in the breeding season, all of the birds in your local population might be at a different stage of potentially multiple breeding attempts. So we had birds that failed early in incubation and tried again twice or three times. We had birds that failed during incubation and went back into non-breeding behaviour. We had birds that failed close to, to hatching and made another attempt and we had birds that never bothered to try I say never bothered but made no visible attempt to to actually have a, a breeding attempt at all um, whether or not they were paired is very difficult to tell the failure rate during incubation is ludicrously high um, far too high but the population as counted in the breeding season, has a notable number of non-breeding birds, particularly males actually. Um, and that's something to be aware of if you're doing a local census. And one of my biggest questions and the reason for that bird wearing its geolocator is because we actually don't know very much about where our birds winter. Um, that's important if you're considering coordinated activity across a flyway. Uh, but it's also important in considering coastal developments and international policies. Now, you may be aware, you probably are aware that until very recently, curly were being shot in France in winter um, and on passage. And if an individual country wants a place at the table in the ongoing discussions about France's policy on shooting waders, it would help to understand what proportion of our local breeding birds are actually vulnerable to those activities in France. So we colour mark all the birds that we tag. We've had um, a handful of passage records actually from birds caught in 2016 and 2018. Um, I've picked up two birds wintering on Anglesey uh, that one of which was tagged on Anglesey and one that was tagged in the uplands of North Wales, um, which is really interesting because it suggests that at least a proportion of the birds just don't leave Wales at all, presumably unless the weather gets very bad. Uh, so I need to recover some geolocators, so I'm going to have to crack the problem of not being able to catch curlew twice. Thank you very much for listening.